Back in 2014, people were shocked that Disney was going to use their acquisition of Marvel to produce an animated feature-length movie. But Big Hero 6? That's a team that, like, nobody had heard of. And look, I'm a big comic book fan, but I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I knew all about Big Hero 6 before the Disney movie. But it was really good, so I wanted to look into the Marvel Universe and find every little bit of information that I could find on the team. And what I found was... Well, it was, it was weird. And this rabbit hole that I found myself falling through led to a lot of interesting information that was pretty weird. And also I uncovered like the entire reason why we're not gonna see Big Hero 6 in the Marvel comics in any way, shape or form moving forward. So I guess without further ado, let's look at the history of Big Hero 6 and its future. Part one, the original comic. So in the 90s, anime started to get popular, like really, really popular. Because of this, all things Japan were on the rise, and Marvel wanted to get in on it. Although it got overshadowed by bigger pushes like the Marvel Mangaverse and the Marvel Tsunami imprint, one of their first attempts to make Japan-centric comics was a miniseries called Sunfire and Big Hero 6 in 1998. However, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Sort of. See, although the Sunfire and Big Hero 6 miniseries was the first appearance of the team, they were actually created to first be used in the Alpha Flight series, but a scheduling conflict caused the miniseries to be released first. At the time, Alpha Flight was being handled by the tag team duo of Steven T. Siegel and Duncan Rouleau. These two would later go on to help create Man of Action Entertainment and developed the group's first project, a little show called Ben 10. In the comic continuity, Big Hero 6 was founded and directly funded by the Geary Industrial Corporation, a secret group of Japanese politicians and business entities. This team was meant to be the premier supergroup of Japan, kind of like the Avengers, and was even officially sanctioned by the country itself. The group was originally led by Kinyochio Harada, better known as the Silver Samurai, an on-and-off-again villain who's frequently at odds with Wolverine and the X-Men. He has the mutant ability to create tachyon fields, which he usually puts around his sword, which allows allows it to cut through pretty much anything. Other early recruits include Liko Tanaka, a former Yakuza member that was released from prison in order to test the experimental Gogo Tamago exosuit, which allows her to absorb, amplify, and channel kinetic energy, which usually amounts to her turning into a big fireball and smacking into things. She was basically forced to join Big Hero 6 as a part of her get out of jail deal. There's also Hiro Takachiho, a kid genius who's almost always accompanied by his robot butler slash bodyguard slash best friend, Baymax. This robo dude runs on water and has a very old school mobster vibe to him. He also turns into a dragon because comics. If that wasn't already enough, then Baymax was also built using brain engrams of Hero's departed father, which means that his robot servant literally has the memory, personality, and thoughts of his dead dad. Oh yeah, and Hero's mom doesn't know about this at all. Let's also not forget Aiko Miyazaki, aka Secret Agent Honey Lemon, a code name that she pulled from her favorite TV show. Honey Lemon is a brilliant scientist who worked in the R&D division of a Japanese spy agency. She's so smart that on this official power chart, she's only a tick below hero in terms of intelligence. However, her greatest creation might just justify this. While in the science department, Honey Lemon created the Power Purse, sometimes also referred to as the Nano Purse. This normal looking bag is probably one of the most powerful objects in the entire Marvel Universe. It uses a... <laughs> I'm sorry, what, what is that face? <laughs> sorry. It uses a combination of miniature wormholes, pin particles, and nanotechnology for her to shrink and store a limitless amount of objects that she can then pull out to fit literally any situation. Sure, it might just seem like a Hermione-style bag of holding, but the stuff contained within is all over the place. You need a radioactive dampening blanket? Power purse. Refreshing glass of water? Power purse. V volcano cover? Power Purse. It later turns out that the Power Purse isn't just limited to items that Honey Lemon puts into it though. Like the team needed a hypothetical energy conversion blaster during a fight, so she reaches in to find it. Turns out that in this instance, she actually took the gun from Mr. Fantastic, who is all the way in the Andromeda galaxy. Kinda makes me wonder why she doesn't just try to assemble the Infinity Gauntlet or something. Finally, there's Shiro Yoshida, aka Sunfire. 
which makes sense since his name is literally in the title of the series. He's Silver Samurai's cousin and a former member of the X-Men with the ability to superheat matter into plasma. Because we're only dealing with three issues, the plot of this series doesn't have a lot going on. It mostly just gets the team assembled with a bit of awkward writing. I think my favorite bit is how the use of Japanese honorifics such as San, Chan, and Sama are almost never used, but when they are, you get, it was a gift from your mama-san. It's a weird choice. So the original three members of the team are Silver Samurai, Gogo, and Honey Lemon, and they hope to recruit Hiro and Baymax, but they declined since Hiro was still in school. That all changed when Hiro's mom was kidnapped by a villain named the Everwraith, the astral embodiment of those lost in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, that's a heavy subject for literally the first adventure, but hey, they don't do much more of that premise than like a villainous monologue or two. The team needed help, and who better than Japan's premier superhero, Sunfire? Turns out though, that he's dying from radiation poisoning brought on by his own powers, which are also now going a bit out of control. He just wants to be left alone so he can die in peace, but Big Hero 6 is determined to cure him. This culminated during the big final fight with Everwraith, when Sunfire comes out to help, and more or less defeats him single handedly by creating a big energy blast to save the day and also faking his death. Like I said, this was only three issues, so there's really not a lot that this book could really do. Despite it being all over the place and pretty lackluster, I really do need to give it credit for managing to establish a brand new super team made up of mostly all new characters and having a complete villain fight in such a short amount of time. This rocky foundation, though, didn't give Big Hero 6 much to work with, leading to... Okay, so here's where things get a little bit tricky. From here on out, Big Hero 6 only made very small appearances and cameos, with some pretty big and ludicrously weird events in the group's history not even being shown in any comics, with it instead being relegated to being explained in the official Marvel handbooks, which like nobody ever reads. Regardless, let's get you filled in. Silver Samurai ended up leaving the team, which got Hero promoted to team leader. When making a new appearance in the Alpha Flight series where they were being brainwashed, the group needed new members. This led to the creation of two new original characters that were made to help mirror the original lineup, the Ebon Samurai and Sunpire. These characters each had one very small line in the issue, and were literally never seen again, save for a quick picture in another Marvel handbook, the Civil War Battle Damage Report, that again, next to nobody read. But hey, we do have their history, so let me break it down, because wow, it's a doozy. Ebon Samurai was apparently a member of the Japanese Imperial Guard that was killed by the Silver Samurai and was brought back to life so that he could get revenge. He encountered Big Hero 6 knowing that Harada was once their leader, but when he confronted the team, he learned that the Silver Samurai had not only left, but he was also presumed dead while he was venturing by his lonesome. Feeling like he no longer had a purpose, Ebon Samurai joined alongside Big Hero 6 since it would be something to occupy his time. Sunpire is a lot crazier, so just try to follow me here. This is Princess Lumina from a planet called Coronar, located within the Microverse, the subatomic world that you might remember from the Ant-Man movies. Well, in a fight with the villain Deadline, a one-off adversary of Sunfire in 1989 that was literally never seen or mentioned again until this handbook, Honey Lemon needed to protect herself, so she went inside of her power purse. This transported her to Coronar, where she helped rescue the princess. As a result, Honey was worshipped as a goddess, but she had to leave in order to defeat Deadline. Lumina felt indebted to Honey Lemon, so she came along with her to the main universe, helped defeat Deadline with her natural plasma abilities, and joined Big Hero 6. In an attempt to better fit in and please Honey Lemon, Lumina took up the codename and costume of Sunpire, who was Sunfire's dead sister. Again, these characters were literally only seen in an actual comic one time, with no explanation of who they were and how they got there, with each having only one line of dialogue. They left the team off-panel just as quickly as they came, and again, there was no explanation until it was later filled in by the aforementioned handbook entries. Now, on the bright side, new Sunpire and Ebon Samurai content did end up getting made in the form of a short story that was published in the back of the Big Hero 6 relaunch that we'll soon be getting into. But this reads more like an apology for handling these characters so poorly rather than anything else. But now that it's been brought up, let's get to the series relaunch, which is the entire reason why I made this video video in the first place. What even is this book? 
The new Big Hero 6 miniseries was written by comic book legend Chris Claremont, a man most well known for his massively influential work on the Uncanny X-Men series. This seemed like a pretty awesome setup, one that makes me totally willing to overlook just how weird it is that a team called Big Hero 6 only had a five-issue series. Feels like a missed opportunity. The gang got a complete modern redesign that I actually really like, such as Baymax's battle form changing from a dragon to this new mech-like design, which sketches call Baymax 2. Honestly, for as much as I'm about to crap on this book, I actually really like the art, so massive props to artist David Nakayama for doing it. With the Ebon Samurai and Sunfire out of the picture, the team needed new recruits. The first new character came in the form of Wasabi no Ginger, a chef slash swordsman with the ability to create knives out of ki. Because of this, his knives don't kill, but instead render foes unconscious, even when they're lodged deep within a bad guy's skull. Although not a full member of the team, Big Hero 6 was also joined by a woman named Fury Wamu, who is the head of the Exotic Assets Division of the Department of Homeland Security for Japan. She acts as the official liaison to the Japanese government and is the one who directly gives the team their missions. Under Fury, the first mission of Big Hero 6 took them to New York in order to investigate the theft of a bunch of MacGuffins and prevent others from being stolen. It's there that they meet up with the other newest member that was assigned to Big Hero 6. His name is Fred. Just Fred. He wears a t-shirt featuring Marvel's Devil Dinosaur, which is fitting since he's sort of a monster himself. So Fred doesn't actually turn into a monster, but rather he has this monstrous kaiju aura that can deal massive damage. It's invisible to the naked eye, but some people and scanners can pick it up. The entire team is staying with Dr. Ayosama, a researcher at a lab which has the MacGuffins that are being targeted, and his daughter Maris. Basically, she is another child genius like Hero that mostly exists just to set up a painfully forced romance between them. I also have nowhere to elegantly work this into the pacing, but for this whole book, characters spout so sorry as a catchphrase. It's super jarring and doesn't ever feel like a natural part of dialogue. Now, despite the fact that literally half of the super team are adults, Big Hero 6 has to go undercover at a local high school. For literally no reason. They're not trying to uncover any information or achieve a goal. They're just there. Why not go protect the scientists at his lab? That's a great question. I wish we got an answer. I mean, I guess they're protecting Maris, but does that really require the entire team? The entire team, who I might add, doesn't seem to be opposed to talking freely about being superheroes in front of the other students, thus defeating the entire purpose of being undercover? You'd think that that alone would be enough to blow their cover, right? Well, Gogo and Wasabi also decide to help the high school football team win a big game by using their superpowers to easily defeat the competition. But superpowers aside, don't forget that these two are literally adults that are playing high school football football. Honey Lemon, of course, becomes a cheerleader since she's the book's main source of fan service that you absolutely know that I'm going to use in the thumbnail in order to get clicks from horny nerds. If you're one of those that made it this far, hi. Don't worry, you're about to get what you came for. During halftime, Honey Lemon takes a break where she's promptly attacked and put into a bondage situation which turns her into a bad guy. I think my favorite part of this whole scene is when Honey fully turns and the bad dude that did it to her says, quote, perfect my dear, now let's go be villains. Evil Honey Lemon leaves to go steal the MacGuffin from the lab which required Big Hero 6 to intervene. But no, no, Fury and Dr. Ayosama have also been turned into bad guys now. Of course, this leads to a fight during which the possession went from Honey Lemon to Gogo. -Go. The mastermind behind all this villainy turns out to be this woman named, I kid you not, Bad Gal, and she drops the possession of Dr. Ayosama in order to transfer it to Maris. Thankfully, Fury was able to break free from her own possession and took Bad Gal out, saving the day. You'd think that'd be the end of the issue, but nope. It ends with the random revelation that this lab also has aliens. Would you like an explanation of why? So would I. Yeah, the aliens aren't addressed at all, and instead, the next issue opens up with the whole group explaining things to the authorities. Despite the fact that Big Hero 6 is a publicly known about super team that is officially and publicly backed by the Japanese government, Fury takes full credit and responsibility for defeating Bad Gal, having everyone else pretend like they were just concerned high school kids so they wouldn't get hassled by the police. Despite the successful ruse though, the team was still being watched by the cops, so the football kids organize a big diversion version so Big Hero 6 could sneak away from the authorities. The team decided to investigate the aliens, who it turns out were just a bunch of alien children and their ship was broken, which was why they were stranded on Earth. Also, they need Honey Lemon to do their homework. I... 
what <laughs> Anyway, the ship gets, like, instantly fixed, and the aliens go home. Gogo wants someone to explain what just happened, which I agree, but nope, just a whoops, so sorry, hero shot, end book. What the hell was the point of the alien subplot? I reread this whole miniseries three times to make sure that I was being fair in this video, and I still have no idea what I read. Like, the book sort of made sense up until the aliens, but I, I don't know, like... Did they relate to the MacGuffins? If so, that wasn't made clear at all. This book's bad. This book is really bad, but it's pretty. After the 2008 miniseries, Big Hero 6 completely vanished from the Marvel Universe, save for a very brief appearance in a Spider-Man one-shot in 2012, and I'm sure that it's this lack of presence over at Marvel that made Big Hero 6 a prime candidate to get the Disney treatment. Yet, one would expect that with a new and popular movie, there would be plenty of comics coming out to better capitalize on it. I mean, that's the entire reason why the Guardians of the Galaxy came back to comic shelves. In 2014, however, Newsarama asked Marvel if there were plans to use Big Hero 6 anytime soon, with Marvel Marvel saying that there were no plans to feature them in any projects. They would not get their own series again, they would not be guest stars in other books, and there were no plans to even reprint their earlier books. That being said, the animated version of Big Hero 6 got plenty of new content, including a manga adaptation, a Disney comic, a comic series over at IDW Comics, an animated series, Kingdom Hearts 3 representation, and so much more. Also an interesting note is that the Big Hero 6 figurines in the game Disney Infinity are labeled as Disney Originals and not the Marvel superheroes branding. I also sat through the Kingdom Hearts 3 credits a few times, trying to see if there was any mention of Marvel. Nope. Speaking of credits, the Big Hero 6 movie itself does mention Man of Action for creating the characters and team, even though they didn't create Fred or Wasabi. However, their creators did get special thanks in the credits, along with the only acknowledgement of Marvel that I've been able to dig up anywhere. This gives a lot of context to this statement from Court Lane, Marvel's Vice President of Animation Development and Production, that he gave in an interview with Newsarama, making it really look like Big Hero 6 is just no longer a Marvel property. I know that Marvel not owning Big Hero 6 sounds weird. I mean, it's owned by Disney, so the rights are still at the same parent company. However, it looks like this is a property that's officially out of Marvel's hands, and instead are exclusively handled by a different division of the Walt Disney Company entirely. So, if you were hoping to see Big Hero 6 make a return to Marvel Comics in either their original or movie forms, whoops, so sorry, that's probably not gonna happen. I actually had a lot of fun making this video, so if this is something that you enjoyed, then you might want to watch the rest of this show. It's called Because Comics, where I take a look at all the crazy, strange, and straight-up bizarre things that make comic books, well, comic books. So, yeah, maybe like and subscribe, I'd like to have you. Uh, we're going to look at some other weird things in comic book history moving forward. In fact, I highly recommend watching the last episode of this show, where we take a look at the time-traveling shenanigans of Batman, where he was a caveman, a pirate, a cowboy, and it, it, it was odd. But anyway, I hope you learned at least a little something new, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.